Hi, Matt. Hey, Bubba. So I thought a good way to approach your recording techniques and experiences would be to talk about how they've changed over time. So maybe if you could think back to like your last year uh, at Sun as the head engineer and maybe compared to now, maybe if we start with the drums, what was your kind of standard drum set up back then? Like mics, techniques, that sort of thing. Um, I, it hasn't changed too much. Um, you know, a big part of it, it depends on what room you're in. So at Sun, uh, when I was engineering at Sun, there were no vocal booths, there were no isolation. We had two little baffles, but they weren't tall enough to you know, block a singer from anything unless the singer was sitting down. Um, so the big part about recording at Sun is, is that pretty much every microphone in that room is miking whatever you've got them on, and they're also drum mics. You know, the vocal mic is is obviously getting the vocal, but it's also getting a lot of drums as well. So, you know, recording at Sun, you um, had to position everybody in a certain way that you the bleed you were getting was was awesome and sounding great and not super phasey. And, you know, you could get a great vocal while also not making your drum sound uh, really far away. So... Um, Working in other studios that have booths or, or slightly bigger rooms or stuff, you you, know, you can mic the drums differently. Um, and certainly Sun had, you know, X amount of microphones. And when I travel around now, they've got microphones and I bring microphones. But in a sense, my drum micing hasn't changed in that. Usually it's either between one, um, um, one and three or four microphones uh, total. Um, and then I'm also getting the drum sound by what I'm miking instrument wise, you know, around the room as well. So, um, probably not a very helpful answer. No, it is <laughs> interesting. Are you generally doing kind of mono or stereo drums then not including? I don't do stereo really. Um, even if I do like, you know, even if I do sometimes a version of the Glenn Johns thing, I, I very rarely pan those things out. I always feel like the drums feel farther away and, and their image isn't as tight when they're panned super hard. And, and, um, um, so a lot of time when I'm recording a, a band, you know, I've got the mics out there. I'm thinking of, I'm thinking and not thinking at the same time, but you know, I'll have a piano and acoustic guitar or, or something, some natural acoustic instruments out there that are getting drum bleed and those will be hard pan typically. So you're getting a little bit of, of roominess on the drums panned no no close mics on the drums are panned it, there are times where i panned the whole drum kit to one side for like a 60s beatles kind of th panning but rarely do i pan individual drum mics off of each other there are usually one tight mono image and then i'll have a little bit of bleed on acoustic or piano from the drums that are panned out hard and giving it some more of that depth um but starting with drums i always start with a kick drum in the in a mono overhead and I get a really tight uh, image of the whole drum kit as best I can um, and learning the drummer and learning, you know, his kit and stuff. And then I'll add a snare mic if I feel like I need it. A lot of times the snare mic will rotate from there to like if we're doing a song with uh, a lot of times for me, a trick that I use a lot is instead of asking the drummer to keep time on the hi hat, which the hi hat, even if they're in a booth, it tends to like bleed into everything and then you can't take it out later, I'll have them tap on the floor tom with their finger to keep time. And it's a great way to record without a click track or record parts that aren't with a full beat where you have a, a little light floor tom. And you can even just send that to the reverb and leave it in the mix and you, you feel it more than you hear it. So a lot of times the snare mic might slip over to there or something. Um, what uh, mics do you typically use for those for the kick and the overhead then? Is it kind of standard or does it change a lot or? uh it can change when i was at sun a lot of times i used a sure 55 the old kind of elvis vocal mic the older version of the, the sh um that's a great kind of kick drum mic the thing about kick drum mics are um you know I, a lot of people put fets and stuff on there and and solo those things sound great and they get all that beautiful low end but they don't really capture the knock of a kick really well and so they're kind of hard to in my opinion, later when you're mixing and stuff, you always kind of miss that knock and you can't really get it where you can add any kind of kick drum and depending how far close and how you tune the drum, you can get plenty of that low end or it's easy to add a little, you know, 30 hertz or 
40 hertz to uh, any microphone and get some more of the thump, but it's hard to get that knock. So really getting microphones that capture the, um, the um, kind of percussiveness of the kick drum um, and make you feel that kind of um, shockwave, for, for lack of a better word. So a D12 is always great, a D25, D20, all those are great. Even the newer stuff I've used in a pinch, and they've been, they've been just fine. A 57 is great on the kick drum triple six uh, and then overhead um it can really depend on what i'm trying to accomplish with the sound um i uh, i love um uh, you can't go wrong with an old u87 uh, an old altec m11 is what i used a lot at sun um uh, the newer mic that they make that's amazing is the Upton 251. It's a beautiful microphone. That's really great on mono overhead. Uh, AKG C60 is like a pretty fascinating mic on overhead. So I'm always changing that a bit up. It's RC77 if you do it right. Um, and and I like to change it up quite a bit. So, uh, But I just, between those two, you should get the whole kit, all the information on the kit. Because I... I've been experimenting with quite a lot of minimal drum things too, and I tend to use the coals and overheads. And I've wanted to try condensers, but I've always been worried about them not being kind of low end. And that's what's great about the Upton is it really captures low end from a distance, and you'll be surprised what some of those mics that do like U87 stuff. And then you're trying to angle it to not get so much. A uh, big part of my kick drum sound is coming through the overhead, which I think is some weird for some people to uh, understand. Yeah. I'm guessing with all this bleed stuff too, you're playing with polar patterns a lot to control it. Sometimes. Uh, it just depends. Like, you know, sometimes the baffles help. Sometimes the baffles just make a throne like that, and then you don't, then there's no point. So uh, uh, it just depends on, um, a, a, the baffles that the studio has, because a lot of studios don't have great baffles and uh, or keep up with their baffles, and they're just a real pain to move and, get somewhere and then um yeah so it all, it's all kind of like by the seat of your pants have you kind of experimented with like trying things in omni to so like let everything in and try not to control it or like figure eight to try and really control it or oh yeah certainly figure eight is like amazing for getting stuff out um of the mix and putting an omni when you want more stuff and you know how you know how l low end is different you know, on microphones of Omni versus cardioid and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, you know, and some of that's just like, instead of using a D12, getting a EB635 out, that's Omni and stuff like that. So yeah, definitely Mike, knowing your microphones and their polar patterns is a, is a big part of it, I think. Right. Yeah. And one really good technique I got from you was to use main, do most of your EQ on the drum bus to keep the phase right. And that's been really useful for me, actually. Yeah, that's that kind of a newer thing I've been doing. I always am um, uh, trying to change things up and, you know, and, and, and get creative in different ways and learn different things. And that's the most fun. And I'm not much of a big EQer anyways, but, you know, I work with a lot of different producers and engineers and bands and stuff. And it, people are always grabbing for the EQs and um, that's one of the last things I usually do. And I noticed with drums, instead of adding, you know, soloing your kick, so soloing is the worst thing you can do. Um, so just soloing your kick drum and EQing it without hearing it through the overhead too and stuff. And, you know, every time you're EQing, you're changing the phase. And so by just taking all your drums and sending them to a mono bus or a stereo bus, however you got your drums, and then EQing the bus total, it sounds crazy, but, you know, certain EQ points, um, if you add 60 hertz, if you, ne you need to make the kick drum a little bit beefier, 60 hertz doesn't really affect most snares um, or certainly cymbals and stuff. Or if you make it 100, then you're kind of beefing up the snare, the kick, and the toms. Um, and then, you know, if you're adding if you want a little more attack, you know, like what, 1 or 3K, you're adding that to the kick a little bit more knockiness to the kick you're adding to the snare and the talent so they all it's interesting how much little eq you need when you do it all together and how much more it keeps the drums tighter and more glued together so so yeah com if you're going to compress or eq try doing it to just the whole kit on one fader as opposed to individual stuff yeah i'm guessing with eqs you tend to go like pull text kind of broad stuff 
Uh, no, not necessarily. Um, the EQs on my Spectrasonics desk right. are pretty tight, oh, really? like AP, API-ish um, tightness. Right. And so it depends. Pultex are great. I mean, they are program equalizers, so they are great for um, broad broad or narrow strokes. But, um, um, yeah, just kind of – it's also grabbing what's near and what's handy. But um, but I would never say no to a Pultex. Yeah. <laughs> maybe um on the same theme talk about electric guitar how that's changed over time it's stayed the same electric guitars is really interesting electric guitar is really about the player um but very rarely do i ever put the microphone right up on the speaker i know that's a lot of people's jams i've just never um it always sounds um for lack of a better word stressed or strained to me um unless you're going for a really in your face almost like direct fuzz sound or something. But usually I put the mic, um, I'll kind of hear the amp in the room and then walk around a little bit and um, put it a couple feet back or a foot back or angle off axis center. All that stuff really depends on the player and the amp and the guitar and and everything. Do you have kind of go-to mics for that? Uh, not really. Um, a 50, you can't go wrong with a 57. Um a U67, if there's one, is a great, great guitar amplifier microphone. Um, a Bayer M160, if they're not playing really loud, is a is a pretty awesome like directional. A U87, uh, yeah, it just really depends if it's a fin, if it's a Strat or a Tele or a Gretsch or, um, and then and then also, you know, the electric guitar like the drums. I'm picking it up with other microphones too. And so getting that, that depth to it. Do you have any trouble with getting enough kind of low end, especially with like a 57, a couple of inches back and lose a lot of low end easily? Do you have any problems with that? No, if, there's, if it's usually something like that, it's usually the tone's not right for the song. You know, the big part of it is while you're getting sounds, instead of having whatever you're overdubbing or doing as being the loudest thing you're listening to in the mix, tuck it back into where you think it's going to be in the mix. And that'll tell you, if the tone's not right, if the guitar's not right, if the part's not right, if the microphone's not right, all those things. So it, it tend to be when you have it, the loudest thing you're listening to, which is kind of common in the studio because your ears are getting tired as you're going on and you turn it up so you can really hear the, every part they're playing. Um, also, by them hearing themselves really loud in the mix, they tend to be rushing instead of laying back in the groove. So pulling, pulling whatever you're working on to be kind of in the mix where you feel it's going to be will tell you a lot about whether you need to get it right. But oftentimes, I've, it's usually not like that microphone doesn't have enough low end. It's usually like they're on the wrong pickup on the guitar right, yeah, yeah. Or, or something. That's a great tip. Have you experimented with ribbon mics much on electric guitar? Yeah, when I was at Sun, we mostly had ribbon microphones. Um, and so I did a lot of ribbon microphones, uh, RCA 77s, 44s, very acoustics and stuff. Yeah, and depending on what you're doing, uh, a lot on the... Uh, Dave Cobb, the great uh, engineer producer, Dave Cobb, when we were working with Jason Isbell, he told me, because he had done Southeastern before we started working, that, that he really loves Cole's 4038s on Jason, vocally, acoustically, and electrically. Um, and so we did some of those on there on guitar and stuff too. Yeah, and, and, and they sound great. Of course, Jason sounds great through um, an iPhone speaker. But... Um, yeah, certain the the Byron one sixty is a ribbon. Um, I diff, depend on what I do. Yeah, I do have like a seventy seven kind of far back on that on the microphone. But yeah, mostly uh, just um, it, yeah, it, like I said, it, it depends really on the style and the genre and the song and stuff. But um, yeah, just about anything you yeah. put on put on a guitar. Have you tried more kind of modern ribbons like the Royers or AEA or anything like that? Um, yeah, the. Um, the Royers, I've messed with a couple different Royers. They've actually never been my favorite on electric guitars. I know that's a lot of people's favorites. They, that hasn't been where they've shined for me. Um, and then um, AEA makes that R88 is fabulous. Uh, the stereo ribbon microphone. I ha haven't used that on electric guitar. Um, I haven't tried some of the AEA stuff, but I've tried their 44s and stuff. But yeah, usually I use them on something else than the guitar. Right. Um, Definitely be cool for a kind of stereo, tremolo, magnetone thing. Um, so maybe moving on to bass, uh, how's that changed over time? You got typical kind of techniques, or is it similar to electric guitar? 
bass um at some was a lot of upright bass so uh you know it's you know upright bass uh, upright bass is sort of a, a dying art in a little bit about you know people having a really nice good sounding bass and knowing how to play it properly um there there are still some great players out there dave rowe and and um i'm having a brain brain fart um uh, he, he learned from Bob Moore. He played on a bunch of records with him. Crap. Anyways, uh, upright bass is... Um, so it's, it's a very interesting thing to record, especially when it's live in a room with other stuff because it's going to be the quietest thing in the room. Um, but, you know, um, it can be different microphones. I've really experimented different microphones after Sun because that Sun only had so many microphones. I mean, electric bass, you know, is... Um, uh, one thing about electric bass is I never use the DI and the amp signal combined. No matter uh, to in my to my ear, no matter how much I've like measured the the delay from the amp to the bass, and I played the phase, it always still sounds weird to me when I just mute one. It sounds better. Yeah, I've had the so, same experience. Yeah, so I might record both, especially if the B15 it can be kind of farty, like pretty much every B15 out there. Um, I'll record a DI signal too, and then. Uh, it's always interesting what sounds better in the mix. Um, and I, never, ever do I add low into the bass guitar. It usually has more than enough. So I'll add like a pokiness, like around 800 or 1K. And I um, I never really compress the bass very much. It really depends on the player. But so many of the guys I use are, have such a great touch. They know when to dig in and know when to bury play that... Um, if you try and compress them, they can heal it, hear it, and they say something. And then I don't, I respect that in the mix as well of not over compressing it or compressing it too much. So I might just tickle it a hair, um, especially if we're going to tape or something. But um, so in terms of techniques, is it kind of a mic a few feet back again, or uh, it can be? Yeah, there's a at the Phillips Studio that I'm talking to you from right now. They have a, an amazing two u48s and a u47 and uh, one day i put the u48 you know like two feet off the bass amp and it was done it was just done so um other mics you might need to move in a little bit closer but yeah you, same thing as the guitar having some space on i think is always is always helpful i don't think microphones like to be that close to really loud stuff either you know i think it's, it's like your ear and then there's a magnetism going on with the speaker uh, especially in a bass amp with those big, um, you know, behind the drivers, those big blocks, you know, and so it's got to mess with a, a microphone, I would think, being that close to it. Do you have, uh, to kind of take a detour, at Sun, was there a lot of kind of pressure to make things sound like kind of people expected from Sun, like the Zod kind of, obviously Elvis and Jerry Lee Lewis and that sort of thing? Was there a lot of pressure to have that kind of sound quality? Well, I wanted to have that sound quality in general because I feel like if you're going to Sun, you're going there for a reason. And, and it's great when people want to go to Sun and do something different. Sam Phillips always said, if you're not doing anything different, you're not doing anything at all, which I always really love that quote. So, and I, But I also appreciate people wanting to come there and, and sound like 1955, especially when that's so hard to do these days because everyone's going on Pro Tools and stuff. So I had the same mono type tube equipment that sam used in the 50s and we also had a radar and a, a 60s studer console but it would get you more um you know not so time period sounds so you know it's just kind of feeling the artists out when they come and what what they want what their goals are and and you help them re reach those was there anyone who kind of came in for like a really modern sound oh yeah i mean we had tons of like you know we had metal bands and and modern country and like 90s band come in so yeah but i mean and that's totally fine it's cool to hear those things done in that room as well it's it's cool to see how versatile the room can be and then using like you know this old slap back but for a modern thing and stuff so okay so going back to uh the instruments what about acoustic guitar have you that changed much over time um not really. I guess I'm. I guess I'm a loser. Uh, acoustic <laughs> guitar, you know, really depends on the guitar player and the guitar. You know, some acoustic. I don't like really zingy acoustics. I love Big Star Records, yeah. but every time I try and get that zingy thing, I I don't like it. Um, and I don't really put more than one microphone on the acoustic either. Again, I've, you know, 
by itself, sure, it sounds great, but then you try and put in the mix and, you, you know, yeah, um, take up having a, a wide acoustic is not really, if it's one part, it's not really stereo. It's just one wide ass mono track um, that's taking up a lot of range. So, um, I, well, I guess one of the newer tricks I've, I've started doing the last year or two is um, for a lot of these artists that are performing, singing and playing at the same time, I have a pair of old Bayer M160 microphones, ribbons, and they're hypercardioid. And those things, um, it's amazing. They sound great on vocals and acoustic, and they reject each other really well. So like, I just finished with Iron and Wine, and he was doing a record with Calexico all in one big room with drums and everything. And he sings really softly and plays really loudly on the acoustic. And the buyers, the, the ribbons tame the, the clacks and stuff on the acoustic. And it also rejected the voice and got the guitar. And then the vocal buyer got the vocal really well and rejected the acoustic. And I had a great image and he could even go in and punch a word uh, or something without having too much bleed. Um, and, and especially with the drums and stuff in the room. So buyer in one sixties are really great. It's not the greatest acoustic guitar sound in the world, but if you put, you know, a 414 or a U67 or something, and you get all that other bleed, then it you have the greatest sound acoustic with a bunch of cymbals in there, and it doesn't matter. So, Byron with 60s are great in the acoustic. Um, U67 is great in the acoustic. A H AKG C60. Yeah, it depends if they're singing or if they're playing, and then you know all this is relative. Yeah, of course. Uh, I know it's not the sexy answer to have no, no, of course you know, it's presets and stuff, but. Yeah. But, um, you know, if it's a Taylor or a Martin or a Gibson, if it's new strings, if it's old strings, if it's a jumbo, if it's a parlor, if it's a slide, uh, all those things really play into like, and then what, you know, and half of it is too. also, I like to cut everything live. So I may only have one U67. And so it's like, does it go on the acoustic or the electric? And so a lot of these things are just basing on what you've got in the room. And that's what's fun too, is when, you're using all these other microphones and someone last minute switches from, you know, piano to something and, and you go to mics already on the vocal or something. So you find something else that works. And then also when they go in an overdub and it's midnight and you're tired of going out there and adding new microphones. So you just go, why don't you go sit at the piano mic and we'll do that acoustic and then how cool it comes out. So, um, do you have a kind of go to first position to try like 12 fret or, no, it's same thing as the electric is hearing them play and moving around the room. Uh, the farther back you mic the acoustic, the bigger it'll sound. Is is um, I know it sounds crazy, but um, if you keep moving the mic back, depending on what microphone you're using, it'll get bigger and bigger sounding and get more full range instead of like um, you know just really bright dead or our stuff. So um, yeah, just moving around and hearing them in the room, and then you know. You, they can move around on the microphone too. They know acoustic guitar player ever stands still. So a big trick that I usually do is just tell them, Hey, put your headphones on, um, get in the position I had you in play and now move inches left to right and see how it changes and find where it sounds best to you. Um, and by doing that, it just gets in the, it really solidifies in their head how much they're changing the sound by moving. And you'll kind of see them every take, sit back down and, move back and forth and wiggle till they get the sound instead of you going like, Hey, you moved, stay right there. You know, it kind of puts, it puts the fader, their fader in their own mind at that point, And they're more cognizant of it. So that's a really um, good idea. That, that little trick can, can work too. You ever worried about uh, blowing the ribbons out on the bears on vocals? No, if someone's singing that loud, then I wouldn't put it on them anyways, because, uh, is they're just not great for that high SPL, um, it, you know, uh, it, certain microphones, even like, you know, like U47s, that's what those old classic soul records, a lot of those are the U47 crapping out because they're singing so loud. And, and that is a great sound for certain things, but not for others. And same thing with the buy, you know, ribbons never sound good, pushed hard. Um, so if they're singing loud like that, then they're, hey, I'll have the microphone way off them, we'll work on vocal technique and, It'll be something else up yeah. there. Yeah, and whenever I see Dave Cobb using a forty thirty eight on vocals, it gives me secondhand anxiety. Yeah, it depends. You know, like Jason Jason gets loud in moments, um, but he's not always a he'll go from release. He's very dynamic, but he also has great vocal 
technique where he backs off the microphone, turns his head, that kind of stuff. Right. So I guess now would be good to talk about uh, vocals. You got any other mics than the ones you've mentioned that you kind of go to? So I guess obviously the Neumanns and the AKGs. Uh, four four. Uh, uh, sorry, not four fourteen. I don't use a four fourteen on vocals. Uh, M one sixty, like I said, can be great. Um, a RC seventy seven. Uh, SM7 is obviously obviously fantastic. That Upton 251 that he's on the overhead is a great vocal mic. Unless they start singing really loud, that's when I feel like it kind of falls apart. Phillips has a phenomenal um, U47. U67s are great. Yeah, it, it really depends on the artist, again, in the song. Yeah. I know that's not yeah, I know it's the answer people want to hear every time, but it really, really is... Um, you kind of go into a set. You can go into a session with preconceived notions, but I feel like that always just kind of um, holds back your creativity. So a lot of this, I kind of wing it as we're going, and if, how I'm inspired in the moment is how I like things. And so um, I never really do the same thing twice. There might like we, we're talking about go tos, but rarely do I just start with the go tos. I kind of like as we're going, I'll grab what's near and what I'm hearing in the room, what I think will work for that. Yeah. Um, There's certain kind of things in different people's voices that you can hear that would work with different microphones. Yeah. Some people have like a whistle. Some people uh, over-exaggerate the S's. So you don't want to use something that's really bright and around this 5k range. Um, yeah. So it all, it all depends. And then do you want it to overload? Do you want it not to overload? Do you want it to, uh, so yeah, all those things play into it. Uh, so maybe we can move on to piano now. Um, has that changed over time? Has it kept the same? Piano, um, like upright or grand or yeah. Uh, at Sun we had a little spin. We didn't have a grand or nothing, and we put fifty-seven mic clips inside the thing so we could put fifty-sevens or or something like that in there and close the lid. Um, and that's just to get really kind of Jerry Lee attacky piano sound by the hammers and also to get rid of some bleed um you could also mic the, mic the back soundboard as well um at phillips they have a beautiful baby grand and someone installed u87s in there back in the 60s uh on little atlas stands inside so you could close the lid but you also had the low end um microphone exactly where you you would want to put it you weren't beholden to however long your atlas stand was or trying to get it in the lid open part way. Um, so that's a great way to use it too. But um, a lot of times I just use mono piano mic. It seems like it sits in the mix better. Um, piano takes up a lot of range, especially in the lower mids. Um, and so doing it stereo and spreading it out, it can kind of cover up background vocals, acoustic guitar, guitar, strings and stuff. So, so sometimes I'll just do like a mono ribbon or, or something a little bit farther back. Given that you use mono so much, have you tried kind of mid-side much? No. Oh, really? No, I'm too redneck for that. <laughs> I've I, Sometimes when I've got masters back, I can hear where the mastering engineer has done mid-side stuff, and it always sounds phasey and kind of scoopy to me. So I've always been... I'm sure a lot of them are getting away with stuff I've, I'm... I don't know about which is totally fine, but th there's been so many ex 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 um, times of it where it's been overused as like a trick that I don't like that sounds. And so I, I don't mess with it like that. You know, like um, at that point you have, if you're mixing, you have all the tracks so you can, you can nail it at the source. Then it's better than trying to do it in the mid side. Right. I mean the uh, kind of mid size mic technique rather than um, kind of mixing mid size. Oh, I see what you're saying. Oh yeah. yeah no, I don't do that yet. All right. Have you tried it and not had much luck with it? or I've tried before, but yeah, it's usually like by the time it takes me to set those things up and get them going, it's we're missing the take. So, um, you know, like strings and stuff, I've definitely done um, some, not mid-side, but some of the other microphone techniques and stuff. But as far as tracking and stuff, yeah, I'll just, I'll usually just put a mic up and, and, uh, or, or the two. Yeah. So do your techniques change much when you're working with like producers like Dave Cobb? Do you have to kind of, do you know their tastes and kind of work around that? Uh, yeah, I try. And, well, I, a, I don't want to make the same record every time. So I want every record person's record to sound unique to them and different. Um, so I change it up whether you're working with the producer or not, you know, 
I don't want to approach every session the same because I don't want. I feel like I owe it to the artist and the listener and to myself to continue to be different and better and not to just phone it in or or do the same thing. I, you know, it's it, especially if you're working in the same room a lot. They, you want them all to shine differently. You don't want to go like, oh, that's the same drummer and the same drum sound on that record that's on this record. Um, and then when you work with different producers, especially Dave, Dave's got a great ear. He's very hands-on. Um, so, you know, he'll grab microphones, move around, he'll grab mic freeze cues and stuff. So you're kind of tagging, tag-teaming it, which is great. And then there's other producers that, you know, aren't engineers. They want you to engineer. They just or, you know, focus on the performance. And they'll tell you when they want something to sound different, but they may not be able to explain it in a technical way, but more of just a creative way. So, it, yeah, I love working with both both types. It, you know, you always, you can learn from everybody, um, even if they're doing something you, you don't agree with, um, there's a there's something to be learned in there. So, um, so I, I recommend working with as many people as you can, artist-wise, producer and engineer wise because there's always things that you can learn and and you can hear what it, it's fun to hear try and hear how other people are hearing instead of about being stubborn about how you're hearing and once you learn how other people are hearing uh it opens up new doors and stuff um so was it right that at sun you didn't track with headphones at all uh, some sessions we did have headphones, but uh, Margot Price's first record, yeah, a lot of the records we did were, were without headphones. And there's also a Altec speaker in the in the studio I could pump audio or vocals or something through. But for the most part, we did without headphones. But some bands, you know, who are playing louder and want a more modern thing, they don't play quiet enough for that to be possible. So then you'd have uh, without some headphones real quick. But with headphones, my favorite thing to do is just give everyone the same stereo mix. So it's essentially, it's like playing without headphones. We all share the same mix and you can't turn some th something up or down and you, you're not just listening to yourself. You're listening to everybody. Yeah. Did you ever have problems with uh, bleed with that kind of speaker in the live room? No, if you angle it the right way and you move your microphones the right way, it's, it's not a problem. Right. Do you know the uh, Trinity Sessions album by uh, Cowboy Junkies? Uh, I don't. It's one that they recorded it um, just with a stereo mic in a church. Oh, cool. And the vocal sound is the singer singing through a 58 or something, going through a PA into the mic. And it's actually a really amazing vocal sound. I'd love to hear that. Yeah, it's a really great album. They did a really nice cover of um, Sweet Jane by The Velvet Underground. I really recommend checking it out. That's awesome. So yeah, I've, I guess I'm asking for advice now because I'm, I record a lot in kind of one big room with no kind of way to control bleed and that sort of thing. Would you recommend trying like that sort of monitoring with one speaker? Like, or can you think of any other ways to do it without kind of going into loads of headphones? Well, it just depends. I mean, you got to do what your artist feels most comfortable. Right. You can't, you can't push. I don't think it's great to push um, how you want to necessarily do things. The artist, if that's the, the if the, if they're not feeling that off, they if they go and say, yeah, we want to do it without headphones, and then you're working together to do it. Then a lot of times people are just turning their amps up or they're playing too loud. You know, back in the day, they couldn't play drums that loud. Um, and the quieter you play drums, the bigger you can make them sound. When you play drums really loud, they actually kind of chokes all the notes off. And um, sure, you're getting all that attack, but you're not getting all the overtones and stuff, and it sounds smaller. Um, but you know, the artists are all like, "I really can't hear myself to sing," and you're not getting vocals, and they're getting fed up. Then there's nothing wrong with getting. There's nothing wrong with headphones as long as you, you know, approach them the right way, and and the artist. Um, you know, they don't just turn themselves up. When you give everyone their own channel, that's where it goes haywire. But at all times, no matter what you're doing, the artist needs to feel comfortable and and can hear and do things. Otherwise, you're just you're pushing things on them that um, won't lead to the correct performance. And then, A, you won't get a return customer and you won't have anything to, to finish. So, Was that... Um... Margot Price record done with just with the speaker or just her singing like in the room acoustically? Uh, 
it did depend on the it was song the song right. case yeah the um the all american made record is the first record i heard made by you now that record was with headphones but those were at phillips and those were the, the like i said it was just we all had the same mix they couldn't even control their volume they all shared the same volume so it's like playing without headphones and um but yeah the the the, the midwest farmer guitar that one was done without headphones but you know if there's a song where she needed headphones i would have right out you know? yeah um so do you ever have do you kind of have any techniques for because obviously you're inspired by a lot of older recordings but your records do sound very kind of modern in the low end do you have any techniques for kind of blending those two things um not really like i said i don't really boost any low end of the bass a lot of those old records they cut the low end out so they could get it louder on the disc on the vinyl um but, you know, like a whole lot of shaking going on has tons of low end rumble through the piano mic, pick up the drums. <laughs> um, but yeah, you know, I don't stone, uh, I don't really EQ the bass. I like to leave it alone. And I usually let the kick drum take the bottom over the bass. That depends on the song. Um, but yeah, you know, I never really think about the low end ahead of time of wanting to be like this or this i just you know it's right. trying to think as little as possible as you go i'm guessing you don't do much on the kind of uh two bus at the end then no i uh don't really eq ever on the two bus um and i just do a little peak limiting on through a spectra songs compressor although i do now have there's a guy in england that makes a copy of a fairchild um, but he uses the original transformers if you want. And, um, I bought one from him and it has a parallel mix section where you can blend it in on itself without really any phase shift. Uh, he does it really well. And so lately I've been going into my six tens and peak limiting, not compressing this peak limiting. And then sometimes I'll go on the fair child and just even just doing a DB or two of gain reduction, but then, maybe adding that 30% back in as a parallel and it just makes everything sound a little bit gooier and nicer. Is it still going through all the tubes, even if you're kind of just mixing in slightly? Yeah. Right. I I wanted to ask you about the um, Spectronics as well, because when I kind of look at demos of them, it's all like kind of very aggressive and it gets really crunchy really quickly but that's not something that I kind of hear all over your records. So are you just using them like very slightly or? It's really, they're the weirdest compressor in the world. And um, a lot of people didn't like them because they just compressed so fast. They thought they were just like a joke, um, but they're super fast. They're like 80 nanoseconds or something on their attack time. So the thing to remember is, and they're mic level in, not line level in. That's why they're a little bit hot on the input side, because they envision you putting in between the microphone and the mic pre, uh, which is a great way to use them, um, because they are a peak limiter box first. So the best example I can use is like if you're hitting a tambourine on a microphone and you've got the mic pre all the way down, but it still sounds like it's clipping. Um, that's these peaks in there and voltage peaks and so if you put the 610 between the microphone and the mic pre um you won't hear those that that overloading sound even though your gain's still up um and um and also the the spectra songs can be really um clean for a compressor so uh once you wrap your head around the input side of it um the slope all the way to the right is like one to one. And then all the way to the left is a hundred to one is brick wall limiting. And the release function all the way to the left is zero seconds to all the way to the right, 10 seconds, but it's not really 10 seconds. It's based on how much low end you have. So you could put all the way to the right and then it's still letting go before 10 seconds. Um, so it's a really weird compressor, but um, the faster the release, the faster it's going to distort is a good rule of thumb. And um, if you play with it on drums, for example, you can really hear what it does. If you just turn up the input and you got your slope at like one to one in a fast release, when you barely see it flashing yellow and there's no 
um, deflection on the gain reduction meter than your peak limiting. As you turn up the input or the slope or whatever, and you see gain reduction in the in the light is constantly flashing, and you'll see deflection. Then you're peak limiting and compressing. Um, so if you put down the drums, knowing that you start off with just kind of peak limiting it, turn your slope up, and you you'll be amazed. It's so fast that it doesn't pump, so you don't get any of the artifacts of like compression of like um, uh, 1176 or something. But turn it up, and then have your release set ultra fast, and it'll distort faster. If you move the release to like 10, it's almost like a gate. It'll push all the symbols and stuff down. And you'll just have the kick and snare really poking through. Uh, and so you kind of look like that. You'll learn different things because it's really versatile and it's, um, it's just way different. I think people try and use it like 1176 and that's where they don't understand it, you know, and then Chad Blake is famous for using it in crunchy mode. Um, and it is it is fantastic for that as well. It's a really musical overloading that it can do. Have you tried the uh, modern versions? Yeah, yeah, I've got the pair of the V610s, which is their mastering version. That's what I have on the two bus, and then I have I have four regular vintage 610s that I use for tracking and mixing and stuff. Right. Are the new ones kind of pretty similar. Yeah, they're pretty much made exactly the same. The transformers are different because they don't make the old triads anymore, but they operate just the same. Right. You can hot swap them with the old 610s, like card wise and stuff, and they'll work the right. same. Yeah. So I wanted to ask you a bit about uh, what kind of reverbs you like to use and your kind of approach with that. Is it a lot of plates or just using the room or? Uh, room, plate, spring, and then Phillips has the most amazing echo chambers. I'm a big proponent of real reverts. I feel like that's the one thing that digital hasn't gotten really close to yet. It's, um, it's like slapback tape delay and, and uh, reverb. They just have a more 3D, real quality to them where you don't have to turn them up as much. Um, where, pl where digital stuff, you got to turn it up to really feel that it's too loud. You know, if you barely put in a plate or a chamber, something happens to the mix. It gets wider and, you know, prettier. And um, even if you don't really hear the reverb in there. So, yeah, big, big proponent of real plates, springs, chambers, rooms. And then I'm a big, big fan of pre-delay. And I, a lot of people pre-delay pre like 20, 30 milliseconds. I pre-delay like 90 180 milliseconds on a lot of stuff yeah I, I really push push the verbs back into the spaces sometimes yeah do you do a lot of kind of uh eqing pre post sending it to the reverb uh do mostly just filters so i just filter a, a lot of the top and a lot of the bottom off i wanted to ask about um on the charlie crockett album how long will i last what's the reverb on max it sounded amazing I don't know if you can remember the particular song. I remember the song. I'm thinking that's the chamber. That's the big right. chamber of Phillips. What kind of mics do you normally use in the chamber? Uh, it's just either... A, uh, that record, I think, was the EV635. It's mono. Thanks so much for doing this. My pleasure, Bubba.